last time we were talking about how bacteria control their gene expression. And uh, as interesting as bacteria are, uh, they don't have elaborate phenotypes. And most of their phenotypes and most of their gene regulation is kind of what kind of metabolism they're going to do, how often they're going to divide. Um, so I like when we get to move into eukaryotic gene regulation. So um, much of this is true in yeast. Um, but it gets more and more elaborate. Basically, the more cells you have, the more tightly you need to regulate your gene expression. Uh, because in a multicellular animal, your skin cells are doing very different things than your kidney cells. Right? Uh, if you're a single-celled organism, that single cell is doing everything. Right? So in a yeast, in a bacteria, they're choosing which genes they need to express uh, based on what their environmental conditions are. But basically, every yeast is doing the same thing that every other yeast is doing if they're you know, growing in the same environment. Right? Uh, in a multicellular animal, though, cells have to be very specific about what genes they are expressing because they're doing very drastically different functions. Right? We have a distribution of labor, and so different cells in your body are taking on different roles. Um, most cells in your body aren't doing much in terms of getting rid of waste products from their metabolism. Right? Most cells just make waste products. They dump it into the bloodstream and just rely on the kidney cells to express all the genes and all the enzymes that are necessary to metabolize those waste products. Right? So the idea is every cell has is, is got a separate suite of genes, separate group of genes that it's going to be expressing. And most cells have very limited number of genes that they can express. Very early in development, you have a differentiation of cells. And certain cells are set aside to be kidney, and certain cells are set aside to be liver. And they just basically shut off that part of their genome that they don't need. So a kidney cell has only a limited number of genes that is even capable of expressing. Now, it might not express all of them, right? It might have you know, hundreds of genes that it could express, and it only expresses a dozen here. And then maybe at a different later stage, it would express a different dozen. But it's restricted to only those 100, right? And a, and a uh, different cell, if it's a, I don't know what I was talking about, liver. If we're talking about a different cell type now, a kidney cell type, it might have some genes in common with a liver cell because everything's got to do glycolysis and everything has to do cell division. And so there's basic what we call housekeeping genes, genes that every cell has to turn on. Right? Just for a cell to be alive, it's going to have to have you know, certain cells to, to maintain metabolism and maintain cell health. But then it's got a separate suite of genes that are different from the liver, right? You're a kidney, and so you've got a several hundred genes that are, you know, that are important for a kidney cell to express. That kidney cell has basically shut off every other possible gene, right? If it's not a housekeeping gene, or if it's not a gene that's going to be necessary for its function at some point, it has probably taken that part of the genome and packed it away into a state that, you, that kidney cell can't even get access to those genes anymore. They are completely shut off from its ability. So we're going to talk about how that works today and all the levels. And there's several levels of regulation of uh, deciding what genes to, uh, to express and when to express them. Right? I'm showing you a couple of pretty pictures because I love pretty pictures. And they're pictures from development because I love development and I love embryos. Um, just to give you an idea for uh, what it looks like for different cells to express different genes. Right? Um, this is a little zebrafish embryo. Uh, this zebrafish embryo is alive. And it's got a reporter construct in it that's expressing GFP. So the reporter construct is expressing GFP wherever a gene called PAX6 is expressed. PAX6 is a gene that gets expressed in the eye. And there's actually really cool experiments. If you get PAX6 turned on in different tissues, eyes will start growing in different tissues. So if you turn on PAX6 artificially in the leg or in a different part of the zebrafish, you will start to get eyes developing in these weird places. Now, they're not functional eyes because you have to have neurons and all kinds of other things uh, you know, to make them functional. Uh, but PAX6 sits at the top of this um, cascade. And PAX6, wherever it is expressed, starts turning on genes in that cell type to make eyes. Right? It's kind of an uh, upstream uh, indicator of what cell type that cell should be. Right? So it's also expressed in the brain. It's also expressed in the spinal cord. Uh, it's also expressed in the pancreas, I believe. But I'm not showing you that. Um, this is a nematode worm. 
And this is the little uh, chomper. <laughs> uh, this is the mouth. It brings in food. And then there's this uh, preliminary digestive organ that just basically grinds up the bacteria that it just ate. So certain cells in here, this is highly innervated. And so what we're looking at is specific neurons of the, uh, of the worm's nervous system. So here's a cell body, this big green thing. And then that long appendage there is a little axon that it's sending out. Here's a cell body and a really long axon that it's sending out. So you can see a subset of these are expressing gene number one, which is coded for in green. But we're also looking for a second gene that's expression here that's in red. So here's a cell body of a neuron that's expressing gene number two. And I'm, I'm not sure what these ones are. It's just a pretty picture, so I nabbed it. <laughs> um, but this has got a cell body. And then here's long axons that are being sent out from that cell type. So even in the nervous system, I've got two different neurons that are shown here. One of them is expressing the red gene, whatever that is. And other subset of neurons are expressing the green gene. So highly specific cell types are going to be expressing different genes. And then here's a bunch of Drosophila embryos. And in red and blue, each one of these is a picture showing a different set of gene expression. So these are all at a very similar stage in development. And you know, here, like, there's a blue mRNA that's expressed on this end of the embryo. Um, so some genes are expressed very localized. Here, this gene is expressed throughout the embryo. This one's expressed in stripes here. So different cells are expressing different genes. There are multiple levels of control about how a cell decides which genes to express. Okay. There is, actually I left one off. There should be one up here, uh, which is the state of the chromatin, chromatin state. So if you have packaged away your DNA, and, and tightly compacted it into really dense chromatin, you've basically shut off the ability for any of those genes to be made. It's like the most fundamental thing you can do is basically just turn off a chromosome, right? If you turn off a chromosome, there's no expressing genes on that, right? The next level down is transcriptional regulation. So if the chromosome is in an open state and it's at least accessible by the cell, then the cell can decide whether to express an mRNA or whether not to express an mRNA off of it. Right? Am I going to transcribe an mRNA or not? So we'll talk about transcriptional regulation. Once a cell has actually decided to make an mRNA, that doesn't necessarily mean you make a functional protein and anything happens to the cell. So there's a level of whether or not that mRNA stays around, gets amplified, gets degraded, gets edited, gets alternatively spliced. There's all kinds of things we can do to that mRNA um, before it ever gets made into a protein. Okay? So there's the third tier. So one would be chromatin, two is transcriptional, three is mRNA. The fourth is protein regulation. So You've actually made an mRNA. You've spliced it the way you want to. It's actually going to stick around in the cell, and the ribosome actually starts making it into protein. There's multiple things we can do at the protein level. The protein has to be folded into its proper three-dimensional shape. It's going to have to be modified. Almost most proteins uh, in eukaryotes go through the Golgi apparatus, so they get made uh, three-dimensionally get folded properly, but then they get passed through the Golgi, and it gets you know, clipped or edited or glycosylated or you know, all these post-translational modifications. That's going to determine if, whether or not you have a functional protein. And then you may have a functional protein, and it may or may not be turned on. So you might have a protein around, but it might not be doing anything until you flip a switch and tell that protein you should be in the active form. So we're going to go through each of these four levels in some detail, but I wanted to give you a general overview of kind of the multiple levels you can do this at. So number one, chromatin. We've talked a little bit about this before, about the ways that you can toggle chromatin between euchromatin and heterochromatin, the condensed or the decondensed state, right? And most of this is based on what you do to the histones that are coiling, that all the DNA is coiled around. Right? DNA is almost never found just double-stranded DNA naked in the cell or in the nucleus. 
it's almost always coated with proteins and wrapped up around these histones and these other uh, chromatin proteins. So here is, uh, in blue is the DNA, so it's wrapped around these histone octamers, and these histone octamers are being held together, in this case, in a fairly condensed state. And the region where we could access a gene is here. This is a little promoter region. That's where RNA polymerase would have to sit down to actually make me an mRNA. And in this example, this is really condensed. This is packaged in really tightly. And there's absolutely no room for an RNA polymerase molecule to actually get in there and bind to the DNA. So basically, this is chromatin that's in an off state. I don't get to make those proteins. Now, what a cell can do, and often this is what's happening in development. Um, at, the, at the fertilized egg, basically all of the genome is accessible, right? You've got a, a sperm fertilizing an egg, and that egg can be every cell type possible. It, it hasn't, by and large, it hasn't decided which regions of the genome to shut down. Remember we talked about genome imprinting? That's where you actually could inherit from the egg or from the sperm certain regions of the chromosome that were already shut down and not accessible. So there are places where mom or dad, depending on how they made their sperm, might have already decided that that's just a region of the genome that's not going to get made. And so you might inherit DNA that you would never be able to express. By and large, though, the whole genome is fairly accessible to the cell, to that fertilized egg. Um, and so you can do one of two things. You can either shut down regions, and this is what usually, like I was saying, what usually happens during development, right? So at the two cell stage, you haven't done any shutting down. If you separate two cells and a human embryo, they will both become identical twin babies, right? Those two cells still have the ability to make every single cell type. But pretty quickly, those cells are going to take on a specific fate, and they're destined for a certain cell type. And so they will start shutting down regions of the chromosome that the cell knows are never going to be needed. So one of the ways you do that uh, is by removing acetyl groups, okay? So in this chromatin, there are no acetyl groups on the histones. It means they pack together really tightly. This is one of the ways that, that we code for, um, for condensed chromosomes. Now, if you wanted to open that back up, and sometimes cells at this point are fairly flexible and they can start closing down or opening out chromatin, uh, little activator proteins have to come in. So this is condensed chromosome. If I want to actually express that gene, then some protein is going to have to sit down in that region and recruit in this guy called histone acetylase. Histone acetylase is, a, is an enzyme that puts acetyl groups onto the histone octamers, okay? So here's my little green histone octamers, four proteins there. Uh, histone acetylase gets recruited in by this activator, so he comes in and binds some, somehow specifically. Right? He somehow recognizes that this is a region of the chromosome that needs to be unraveled, right? So there's a specific interaction here. That recruits histone acetylase, which is generic, right? It doesn't know what it's doing. It just knows whenever it gets recruited to an area where there's histones, it's going to start sticking acetyl groups on the histones, right? If you put acetyl groups on the histones, that unravels the DNA, or the, uh, unravels the chromatin, and allows that promoter to become accessible. So now I at least have the option to make that gene. I might not make that gene, but at least I've unraveled the, the genome so that it, it's at least possible, right? So the tr tr transcriptional machinery, RNA polymerase, could sit down if it was, if it was brought there. Uh, another way is through nucleosome remodeling proteins. Uh, this is fairly similar. Uh, they're different types of activator proteins. And instead of actually recruiting an acetylase that sticks acetyl groups on it, it brings in this big uh, chromatin remodeling complex. This is lots of proteins. And they go in and unravel the DNA, they unravel the chromatin. So it's not the same mechanism. It's not by sticking acetyl groups. And this is a bad illustration because this doesn't really seem accessible, but it's unraveling, unraveling the chromatin as well. So basically, there's two mechanisms to unravel. You can bring in acetylases, or you can bring in these chromatin remodeling complexes. And they unravel, but without, without putting acetyl groups on there. 
Questions on chromatin level? Yeah. Do those acetyl groups make it harder for that DNA to be transcribed? No, because they're just stuck on those tails from the histone octamers. So those acetyl groups are not on the DNA, although this illustration looks like they're stuck to the DNA. They're actually stuck to those long N-terminal tails that are hanging off of the histone octamers. So, and acetyl groups are very small. Uh, they're not going to make um, you know, steric interactions or you know, make it hard for the polymerase to get in. They just you know, open everything up. Okay. It looks like it's pretty much the same. Like, how, do you, how do you know like, which one is going to be chosen or not? What do you mean, which one's going to be chosen? Like if it's going to be doing a uh, remodeling with the nucleosome or a remodeling with like the histone isolation. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know. I don't think we know as a scientific community. We just know that both of these things are what cells do. Okay. Uh, why they choose one mechanism versus another mechanism, I'm not sure. Um, I'm, I, I will speculate that this is a more permanent thing. If you stick acetyl groups on there, that means you're opening up this chromosome and it's probably going to be a more permanent opening up. If you only want to temporarily open this up, then you would probably bring in the remodeling complexes. Those are proteins that are going to unravel it, but if those proteins leave, it will compact again, right? So, and if you want to compact this, you can do the reverse reaction. There's uh, uh, histone deacetylases, and so a cell can decide, I no longer need this region in the genome, pluck off the acetyl groups, and it'll go back in its condensed form and so you'll have shut it off. So the cell is basically the one who's deciding whether this is a, an important region of the genome or not, by whether or not ex it expresses and recruits. So it's got to express the histone acetylase or deacetylase, and then these proteins have to recruit one or the other to either open it up or shut it down, depending on which one they recruit in. So yeah? Uh, so with certain um, genes that aren't expressed all the time, I remember last time we were using the example of alcohol, just how mm -hmm. we're not constantly making that enzyme. Is this an mm -hmm. example of how that would work, that the gene is not expressed? And is it the, yeah. would occur to express that gene? That, that's probably, um, so that's the difference between like a kidney and a liver cell, right? Uh, a liver cell is going to have the, the enzymes for metabolizing alcohol, for instance, they're, they're going to have it shut down, right? Inaccessible. The kidney doesn't metabolize alcohol, right? Uh, so its alcohol dehydrogenase enzyme is just permanently shut off. A liver cell will have that region of the genome open for business. Now it might not need to express that protein because you might not have any alcohol in your system. But if there is alcohol in the system, the liver has got that region open, it can go in with an RNA polymerase, make you the enzyme you need, and do its business. When the alcohol is cleared, it probably will, will downregulate that enzyme. But it always keeps that region open? But it will probably continue to keep that region open because that's the thing that a liver cell needs to do. It's going to oh, need to do that when the environment is appropriate. So it wouldn't want to permanently shut that down. Uh, this is a, and we're still learning about this and we're not quite sure how dynamic this actually is. Um, maybe the liver cell does actually just condense that region and when the alcohol is present, it unravels the genome and then makes the cell. Uh, we're, I'm still not sure, and I'm not sure if we, as a scientific community, too, are sure how dynamic this is happening in each cell. Um, but there are certain regions that we know just continue to get shut down. I mean, there's no chance of a liver cell becoming a kidney cell, right? Uh, that kind of transitional state just never happens. So there's certain cells that just, you know, certain regions of the chromosome that are absolutely shut down. Uh, if you think about this too, this activator is specific for opening up a certain region of the chromosome. Mm -hmm. He himself, though, is a protein that got made off of a certain region of the genome, right? So if you have shut down permanently the region of the genome that that activator was made in, then you have permanently shut down the ability to open up any other regions of the genome. You see how that layers upon itself, mm -hmm. right? If this guy is a protein who's made off of a region of the genome, and I have shut that region down, I can never make him. So I, he could never come in and open up this region of the genome, because I've shut his region of the genome down. 
So this could will kind of cascade on itself, right? Once you've made some fundamental decisions about what regions of the genome to shut down, you may never be able to reopen those again just because you don't, the, the cell just doesn't have any mechanism to unravel that region anymore. So. Now this is always reversible. <laughs> we know that because we can take skin cells and we can force those skin cells to express at high levels these remodeling proteins. So you can take a skin cell and you can force express all these activator proteins that just go to the entire genome and start unraveling everything. And it basically takes that skin cell and steps it back in time. It says, you don't, you're not specifically a skin cell anymore. I'm going to open up all the options to you again. And that's how we can actually do these uh, induced pluripotent cells, right? Reprogram a skin cell to think it's an embryo. It's got every possible cell type available to it. So this is no, no part of the genome is ever lost in the cell. Just the cell might become incapable of accessing it anymore. And we could artificially go in there and, and open up those possibilities again. Yeah. Uh, I'm just a little confused. Um, are these two ways that you can start transcription? Like, is it these are two ways that you can unravel condensed chromosomes. Okay. okay. Condensed chromatin. All right. I love that we spent like 15 minutes talking about my first two slides. <laughs> <laughs> They were good slides, thank you. Um, I'll, just, I'll just mention this. Um, there's growing evidence that the actual three-dimensional organization of chromosomes in the nucleus is important for expressing genes. Um, we have tend to have thought of genes as just being located on chromosomes, and that's just a place to hold them, right? And it doesn't really matter what chromosome you are. Uh, you're just there, right? And every chromosome is equally accessible in the nucleus. Uh, what we're learning more and more is that if there's a gene on chromosome one, if chromosome two is brought close to it in three-dimensional structure in the nucleus, chromosome one might actually influence how genes on chromosome two are expressed. Um, this is new stuff that we're learning, it's, and I had a whole slide about talking about how you could actually get this kind of data. I'm, I'm going to skip that, but um, just suffice it to say, uh, the, the example I like to use is a hard disk, okay? You've got a hard disk in your computer, right? And the information is stored in different locations on that disk, right? And so there's a little arm that goes, and so your disk is spinning, and the little arm goes and reads different portions of the, of the disk, right? So if it needs to run a certain program, it's, it moves the arm and it starts reading at that location. Right? Same with genes on a chromosome, right? Genes are located on a chromosome and if I want to express them, then I go put RNA polymerase on a region of that chromosome. But what it turns out is that it's actually more like if you had hard disks in a room and how you positioned the hard disks next to each other determined which hard disk got read, right? It's not just the information on the disk but it's in three dimensions, is this disk close to this disk, then you'll actually run that program. If you take those two disks far apart from each other in the room, they might not make those, might not run those programs. So there's this additional layer of three dimensional spatial information that seems to be going on in the genome. So if you want to express a gene, you might bring chromosome one close to that gene on chromosome two and it gets expressed. And then if you want to shut it down, you physically move chromosome one away from it and that shuts it down. Um, this is, that's difficult stuff to study because it's not like you can just take a picture of the, chrome, of the nucleus of every cell in the body and see at what time what chromosomes are lying next to each other. Um, so it's difficult experiments to do and that's why for the sake of time we're going we're gonna to skip them. All right. So that's the first level, what the state of your chromatin is, condensed or decondensed, okay? Now, if you actually do have an open region, then you can decide whether or not to make an mRNA or not. The cell can decide whether or not to make an mRNA. So this is transcriptional regulation, right? Whether or not I make a transcript. Um, what this is dependent upon is whether or not I bring in RNA polymerase to sit down and actually start making a copy of the genome, of the gene that we're going to express, right? So here is the transcriptional start site. This would be the place where we start making an mRNA, okay? 
Here is the basal promoter sequences. Here's the Tata box. Remember when we talked about transcription, the Tata box is where transcription factor 2D sits down. So if a Tata box is open, you know, it's accessible in the genome, transcription factor 2D can come sit down on it. Transcription factor 2D recruits in RNA polymerase. This is RNA polymerase 2, because most mRNAs are made by RNA polymerase 2. There's also RNA polymerase 1 and RNA polymerase 3 that make ribosomal or uh, ribosomal RNAs or tRNAs. But most of the things that are made into messenger RNA are made off of polymerase 2. So transcription factor 2D sits down, brings in RNA polymerase, it sits down, it denatures the DNA strands, and then it starts moving along and will start making you an mRNA, right? Now, it's not sufficient to just have a RNA binding sequence, you know, the region where RNA polymerase can sit down, and a Tata box. Uh, if you just have those two things, you're not really going to make very much mRNA. Um, RNA polymerase is not going to be recruited there very often. Transcription factor 2D is not going to sit down very often. You'll have a little bit of transcription. You'll make this mRNA a little bit, but not a lot. In order to increase this, to actually turn on a gene, you have to have additional activator proteins that come in and sit down on the DNA. They like move things along, right? So it's not sufficient to just have this, what we call a basal promoter, like the bare minimum requirements to get an RNA polymerase to sit down. If you really want to turn on a gene, you've got to get other additional proteins called transcription factors to sit down. So this guy is an activator. This is two proteins. They're dimerizing together. And it is sitting down on a specific sequence called an enhancer sequence. The enhancer sequences are what allow a cell to specifically turn on certain genes and not turn on other genes, right? A Tata box is generic, right? Transcription factor 2D will sit down on any Tata box, right? What is specific about whether we turn this gene on or not is whether there's a specific enhancer region, right? So every gene that's going to be expressed has to have a basal promoter, someplace for the, you know, actual machinery to sit down. But this enhancer region is going to be a specific sequence. And so if a cell wants to turn on, it will make a transcription factor that recognizes that sequence. And these activators then like get stuff going, right? actively recruit lots of transcription factor 2D, recruit in RNA polymerase, and get this mRNA made in a significant, meaningful level. Okay? So these are called enhancer regions. Uh, they can sometimes sit close to the promoter. So they might sometimes be down in here, you know, just a couple of hundred base pairs, 100, 200 base pairs upstream of where that transcription start site happens. In this case, those two little slashes indicate that there might be a huge thousands of base pair intervening sequence before you actually get to the enhancers. Right? So enhancers that sit nearby, we would call those cis regulatory elements or cis enhancer sites, because a cis enhancer site is only going to recruit things to a sequence that's nearby. This guy is a trans enhancer site, because it's not actually that close to where we're trying to get RNA polymerase to sit down. Right? RNA polymerase is going to sit down here. But this enhancer, if the chromosome is actually folded over, you can bring an enhancer site close to a gene you want to express, right? So this might be thousands of base pairs away, and it will then be acting basically in trans to a nearby region. This is how, this, this is kind of, this is difficult to study as well, because this is also based on structurally, three-dimensionally, what enhancer region do you bring next to the gene you want, right? This is thousands of base pairs away. Well, you could bring this close to this one, or you might be able to bring it close to some other gene that's you know, further away down over here. Right? I might be able to wrap that chromosome a different direction, bring it in proximity to a different gene, and it would, it would uh, have its activating influence on some other gene. This is how people postulate that 
separate chromosomes, right? You could bring, if this is chromosome one, right, and this enhancer region is being brought close, well, maybe you could bring the enhancer region of chromosome two in here, right? You could bring a different chromosome with its enhancer region and lay it next to chromosome one, and then the transcription factors that are binding to that might actually recruit in RNA polymerase. Right? So this is a th three-dimensional problem, uh, and we have to start getting three-dimensional information about the nucleus in order to you know, try and address these problems. So right now, we're fairly limited to, to knowing what cis factors do, factors that are close, or, you know, enhancers that obviously have an ability to get close. But in effect, really, the entire genome, it's possible that the entire genome might have access to, to be, being brought in pr close proximity to that transcription site. So uh, there's lots to study. <laughs> we, we know very little about how many or how significant these trans factors are, whether they're far away on the same chromosome or on different ones. Yeah, Rachel. Yeah. Well, so here, here's an additional level of complexity. Uh, so I've got an activator that's sitting down on this specific enhancer sequence. Uh, that activator might actually recognize other sequences, too. So it's a bit promiscuous, right? It might have a whole set of sequences that it might be able to sit down on, right? So this activator might be activating, you know, gene one here but it might also be sitting down on some other sequence at some other location on the genome and activating gene number two, right? And activator number one might sit down to this sequence. I might have it activator number two that's sitting down on a separate sequence. So you might actually have half a dozen or more transcriptional activators, you know, all different transcriptional activator proteins sitting down on multiple different transcriptional activating sequences to get this thing activated, right? This is a very simplistic model when you've just got like one or two that are t that's turning this on. It's actually usually more than that. Yeah. All right. So this, this interaction between the activator and the complex is usually mediated by multiple other proteins in the process too. So this big green blob is just saying, there's other and various proteins that are involved in the connection between these two, <coughs> okay? So the activator proteins, these transcriptional activators, are not necessarily actually bonding directly to RNA polymerase II. They might actually be influencing other proteins that then those proteins bring the, bring the guy in, okay? So we're playing a little game of telephone here, right? You know, he might tell one protein, bring in RNA polymerase, and that protein might tell another one, bring in RNA polymerase, and then that one might actually be the one that brings in RNA polymerase. Right? Uh, what do these transcriptional activators look like? Uh, number one, they're DNA binding proteins, right? Because what they're doing is sitting down on specific sequences, and so they have at least a DNA binding function, and then they're also going to have protein-protein interaction domains, right? So they sit down on the DNA, and then they exert their influence by interacting with other proteins to bring this whole transcription factor uh, complex together. So here's a couple of examples of them. Um, helix turn helix. Most of these work in dimers. So you'll have two proteins that are both helix turn helix structures. Those two proteins come together, and that dimer is the functional unit. So these usually don't, aren't capable of binding DNA by themselves. They have to have a partner, and then the two partners together can bind the sequence, okay? There's ones called zinc fingers, leucine zippers. Um, basically, they just differ in the way that they bind to double-stranded DNA. So, but they usually have some, like, appendages of alpha helices that actually, like, nez nuzzle in the two um, uh, strands of DNA. So they, uh, they bind in a sequence-specific manner, and they bind in the, uh, usually the major groove of the double helix. 
So they are active as dimers, and they can either be homodimers, so I might have transcription factor number one. It might bind to an identical second copy of transcription factor one. Those would become a dimer and bind to a sequence. Or I might have transcription factor one and then a copy of transcription factor two, two different proteins, might dimerize and then sit down and recognize a specific sequence. And you have thousands and thousands of transcription factors uh, that are turning on, turning on different genes. Not only that, multiple genes, so here's gene A and here's gene B, uh, will have multiple enhancer sites that all could be bound by different activators. Right. So gene A has got four different enhancer sites, so four different transcription factors could come in. If all of these are activators, then I would have really high expression of gene A. Right? This is really actively being recruited as an active you know, place of, of mRNA production. Gene B has only got three. It's got sequence two, sequence four, but it have, might have a unique sequence, sequence number six, that also brings in. So in this case, gene A and gene B are being expressed because transcription factor pair two is binding to both of them. They've got common sequences in their enhancer regions. Transcription factor four is binding here. It's also binding to a specific four sequence here. But this one has an additional six, but it's missing one and three. Right. So I've got basically these specific, I don't know, postal codes or, um, I don't know, on-off switches that are specific to each gene. But they might actually share those with different ones. Right. So. I'm sharing two and four, so I'm going to be under the same regulation of transcription factor two and four. But if six comes in, that's going to give a variable expression to the second gene, to, to gene B, right? So which enhancers you have upstream are going to affect how and when you get turned on. Now, activation isn't the only thing that's going on. There's actually transcriptional repressors. Okay, so here's the same illustration, but in this case, instead of being an activator, this guy is a repressor. So it comes in, and when it binds, instead of recruiting RNA polymerase in, it basically keeps RNA polymerase from binding. Okay. Now. If I've got multiple enhancers, though, so here's enhancer sequence one, here's enhancer sequence two, here's three, here's four. If a repressor is made by the cell and it sits down here, but if three activators sit down there, then the activators are going to outcompete the repressor. Uh, this gets messy really quick. <laughs> How many sequences do you have? How many are relevant? How many are acting as repressors? How many are activating as activators? Uh, this allows the cell to have very tight control over how much and when it, it expresses a certain protein. So it's got all of these enhancer sites. And at one point, the cell might make a lot of transcription factors that are activators that recognize those sites. Okay. So if the cell makes all activators, it's going to sit all those activators down. I'm going to make a lot of that mRNA. But if the cell decides, then this is now a time where it's not appropriate to make this gene anymore, it would stop making those activator proteins. It would start making repressor proteins. And then the repressors would all come in and bind and shut down making this gene. Okay. All of these guys are proteins who themselves are being made because mRNAs are being expressed. And all of those have enhancer regions in their regulatory regions. And all of those are being activated by other transcription factors. Uh, you get a fairly vicious chicken and egg cycle going on here, right? Uh, who's regulating what? You know, who's regulating the repressors being made? And who's regulating the regulators that are regulating the regulators, right? Um, you start getting into a, a difficult kind of infinite regress of, of 
what started the whole process and what's really in control. Right? Um, suffice it to say, this is a, an interesting area of, of research, and we're still trying to figure out what the rules are. Right? And we, we have some good ideas. Um, don't worry about the DSC releases. Um, one, last, one last wrench in the system. Some proteins, some transcription factors, are activators in one context, but in a different cell, they might not be acting as an activator. They might be acting as a repressor, depending on whether they're making a homodimer or a heterodimer or what kind of heterodimer they're making. Right? So you could imagine a scenario where if you've got two transcription factors, one dimerizing, they would act as an activator. If transcription factor one and transcription factor two dimerize, they could be an activator. But if transcription factor one and transcription factor three get together, all of a sudden they become a repressor, right? So it, it depends. Uh, it's very critical what transcription factors a cell is expressing, right? And by changing the expression levels of transcription factors, you're going to change the expression of downstream genes. You see how you start getting a cascade, right? PAC6, that one that we talked about at the very beginning, PAC6 gets turned on in the eye and in the brain. PAC6 sits way at the top of this hierarchy. Right? And what PAC6 does is turns on transcription factors. It itself is a transcription factor. So if you turn on PAC6, it turns on other, other transcription factors. Those other transcription factors go turn on other transcription factors. And those transcription factors go turn on other proteins that eventually somehow make the things necessary to make an eye and tell the cells to start making neurons and pigments and you know, lens cells and iris cells and like all these different cell types. Right? So most of the time when we think of development and we think of traits, there's this huge cascade of things that has to happen. Um, the guys at the top we sometimes call master control genes. Because if you turn on PAC6, it's basically going to tell a tissue, start turning all these things on necessary for eye development. Right. So it sits way at the top of the hierarchy. Are you getting overwhelmed yet? Yeah? Well, we're only at the second level of regulation. <laughs> I don't know why you're getting confused. So say, for instance, the cell has actually made all the appropriate transcription factors and has decondensed the DNA such that they actually get RNA polymerase to come sit down and you make an mRNA. Now you've got choices to do with, or you have choices to make about what you do with that mRNA. Right? Um, you can splice it in multiple different ways. And most eukaryotic organisms, their genes have multiple exons and introns. So you might. You, you may have alternative splicing uh, mechanisms. You could also choose to actually just degrade that mRNA. Right? And cells do this. They, they will turn on a gene. They'll start making the mRNA. But if it's not quite the time to make an active protein, they might just start degrading the mRNA that they just made. Um, I think I already made this analogy, but I'll make it again. Um, the uh, aircraft carrier gets an alert that there's some something going on, there might be a dangerous situation, and they start scrambling jets. You just get some jets in the air, right? We don't know if anybody's coming, but you get some jets in the air. Well, there's no instance that there is anything coming, so you just bring the jets back in and land them, but we'll send off another one just in case, right? So you just keep a number of jets in the air, and in case there actually is an enemy to go attack, you've already got them primed and ready, and we can go attack, right? That's kind of what's going on with the mRNA here. It's so like if the cell is thinking, this is about the time that I need to start making this protein, it will start making mRNA. But it might not quite be the time to activate, to really pull the trigger and say, yeah, I'm going to make this protein and do this function. So you might just, you're scrambling the jets, but then you degrade them. You know, you bring them in for a landing. And you scramble another mRNA. And then, well, it's not quite time, so I degrade it. And then when the actual time is, then you actually stabilize the mRNA and turn it into functional protein. So this is an additional layer of, of regulation. Cells can obviously very precisely time when they actually turn genes on and turn genes off. Okay. So mRNA degradation is a part of that. You might not degradate the mRNA. You might just start to transcribe it 
you know, like you actively recruit a uh, ribosome, it's sitting on the mRNA, but then you might stall the, uh, the ribosome. <laughs> so the mRNA is there, it's stable, but you're still not quite making the protein yet. You got like one step further, actually got a functional ribosome sticking around it, but you might then pull another trigger that says, yeah, actually make that protein. We've gone through alternative splicing before. Um, here's a gene. This is actually a, a real gene called calcitonin. Uh, this mRNA ex is expressed both in the thyroid and both in neural cells. And the actual version of the protein they express is different because they alternatively splice the mRNA. So in the thyroid, in the nucleus, they make an, a pre-mRNA or a nuclear mRNA. But they don't make the fifth exon here. Right? They just make exons one, two, three, four. They splice those, one, two, three, four. And then the fourth exon is really the only one that gets made into functional protein. Okay, so the protein they're making off of this gene is just the sequence from there. In another transcript, though, they continue to go through and they make four in the pre-RNA, the nuclear RNA. And they also make five. And then they just splice out four. So when they actually do the splicing and remove the introns, they take exon 1, exon 2, exon 3, and they're removing these peach introns. But then 4 gets removed with these two introns. And so all I get is number 5. And so 5 ends up being the functional protein sequence. Right? So cells, when they make an mRNA, get to choose which type of mRNA they want to make. Right? The reason a thyroid expresses that one is because of proteins that are involved in deciding when you stop making the transcript, right? I made the transcript, and then you stopped at 4, because there were certain proteins that were expressed in the thyroid that, when this mRNA was made, decided that's the kind of mRNA we need. Right? So the cell, the thyroid cell, is determining this. In a neural cell, there's, those proteins are not around, or maybe there's additional proteins around that say, no, 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 skip that, stop, keep going, right? So this is an additional level, right? There's proteins that are expressed in a thyroid cell that tell it to make this type of. And those proteins themselves had to have been turned on by transcription factors that were specific to thyroid cells, right? Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.